to the Prince soft cover. This is Rama Lakshmi and I have with me Patrick Oliville, the author of an exciting new book called Ashoka, the Portrait of a Philosopher King, published by HarperCollins. I also have Ram Chandra Guha with me, who is an editor and curator of uh, an exciting new series that the HarperCollins is coming out, which is, um, which is a whole series of biographies. Uh, welcome, Ram, and welcome, Patrick. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to begin by asking, Growing up in India, we always thought that there, we knew a lot about Ashoka, the emperor. There was enough. Everybody knew. We all read the books. We all read, the, heard the stories, the textbooks. And then I read your book and you say there isn't enough reliable data. In fact, when the book was launched, you even said writing biography without data. Can you explain this conundrum? Every Indian thinks they know Ashoka, but you're saying there isn't enough data. Right. So we have a lot of data, actually, but the problem is whether they are reliable data. So we have a huge amount of uh, hagiographical, uh, biographical uh, texts written by Buddhists from between three and 400 years after Ashoka. And they give a variety of descriptions of Ashoka, especially as Ashoka is the paradigmatic Buddhist king who made Buddhism the center of his life, uh, the center of his empire, and who propagated Buddhism uh, throughout the South Asian subcontinent uh, and also into other parts of, um, of Asia, including China. So this is the kind of thing that we have, uh, but none of those I find uh, credible uh, or we have any uh, any. Uh, external evidence to show that what they say, what the Buddhists say, are actually historically accurate. So when you go to the contemporary sources of Ashoka, uh, some things that are written around the time that he lived, we come up with zero, literally nothing. From India of the third century, we do not have a single text that deals with Ashoka. The only somewhat tangential data come from the Greek sources of West Asian countries with whom both Chandragupta, that is Ashoka's grandfather, his own father Bindusara, and he himself were in close contact. So there is some amount of evidence. For example, uh, Seleucus Nikator's ambassador, Megasthenes, spent several years in Pataliputra during the reign of, uh, of Chandragupta. And he later wrote a book called Indica in Greek. The original is lost, but it is cited by several Greek historians. So that is that kind of evidence. And there we have archaeological evidence, art historical evidence, but nothing really written. So this is the conundrum we have with regard to Ashoka. But on the positive side, what we don't have for most ancient kings, whether Indian or non-Indian, are the words of Ashoka himself, of the king himself. So Ashoka is unique in that sense that he left behind a series of rock inscriptions and pillar inscriptions in which he speaks himself to his people. So we have a sort of a, a, a the Ashoka's own voice coming in, uh, which uh, we do not have for any other author. So what I have tried to do in my book is to depend almost exclusively on Ashoka's own words, to dig deep into it, read very closely, read between the lines, read behind the text, and to see what sort of personality, what sort of persona emerges from his own writings. So that is, in that sense, what is different from my account of Ashoka, from many others who have written uh, extensively about Ashoka, and which you, of course, have read from school textbooks, yes. So it's a sort of Ashoka's monkey baths, as it were, his own words yes. his, and his biography. Um, right. The book comes at a particularly interesting time for India, right? And this is a question I want to ask Ram and uh, Patrick. Um, there's been much debate about how uh, we should move from the, uh, the Ashokan state 
to the cotillion stage you know nehru kind of adopted ashokan um, values as the as the bedrock for the new newly independent republic but now in the last decade or so there's a lot of talk about cotillion state now does a pacifist king and i'm using the word pacifist does a pacifist uh, king befit the new india um is he even pacifist i want to ask both of you this question so i'll answer it first in a general sense and then maybe patrick can answer it in a more specific sense so first of all uh, you know the idea of this series is to uh, showcase works by scholars written for a general audience uh, with an emphasis on scholars so these are works based on scrupulous scholarship hopefully written well in the case of patrick's book written more than well written with great elegance but without a political agenda they're not they're trying to illuminate the past in its nuance and its complexity using the tool tools of research and scholarship and linguistic understanding linguistic and philosophical and sociological understanding they're not trying to tell readers how to behave in the present how to assess their rulers in the present so i think in that sense uh, that question is slightly besides the point however uh one aspect of uh, uh Patrick's book, I mean, the pacifism let him answer, uh, which actually is of compelling relevance to India, to, in fact, to the world today, including to what is unfolding in uh, Israel and the Gaza Strip, is Patrick's understanding uh, and exquisite portrayal of what he calls Ashoka's ecumenism. That you can, you know, the ruler or uh, a community can practice a certain faith without demonizing or stigmatizing people of another faith and it of course multi faith societies which is the case of you know palestine israel india sri lanka uh, patrick's original hometown so on. so but i don't want that that is something because unlike patrick i live in india unlike patrick i write about the present so when i was reading his book as a scholar trying to understand the past this particular resonance with india today struck me but still i'd say that caveat about this work and other works in the series You know, obviously, the next book is about Sheikh Abdullah, and there it may be much closer to our, uh, you know, our present time. So there will be connections to draw, uh, you know, which are much more visible between past and present. Uh, but generally, I think uh, it's a mistake to, uh, uh, you know, I think this book should be read for the knowledge it conveys with such authority, uh, with such elegance, and with subtlety and nuance. I mean, it's it's a fabulous work of scholarship about a remarkable. Ruda, uh, who happened to be Patrick? Uh, yes, um, I was not trying to speak to the current political situation here in India or anywhere else in the world, but of course, history speaks to the present um, uh, often, and I think uh, Ashoka, a figure. Uh, that is in many is remarkably modern ecumenism is something that would have been anachronistic before modern times uh to be able to be able to go beyond your own group whatever however you may define your group it's a political group a caste group uh economic group uh Uh, your own, uh, your own favorite cricket team, right? Talking about Ram here, uh, uh, pulling for India, pulling for Afghanistan. Uh, to go beyond that, Ashoka says, break the barriers, speak to others. You cannot be truly a educated person. You cannot be truly learned person if you are listening only to yourself and to those who think like you. So I think that is uh, I'm giving a talk at Ashoka University, uh, interestingly, right? Ashoka University uh, on Wednesday, and I will try to link a liberal arts education to Ashoka's own message. Liberal arts education, what does it do? It invites you to think expansively. It it expects you or helps you uh, to uh, to relate to other disciplines. and your own so bringing walter and ashoka together at ashoka university 
right? <laughs> right. Yes. Exactly. And I was hoping that uh, that uh, Ashoka's uh, building bridges, breaking down barriers, could be one way of looking at uh, at uh, uh, at a liberal arts education as opposed to a specialized education where you go for three years. I was in Oxford. I studied nothing but Sanskrit, right? Right. I was not exposed to art history, anthropology, modern history, none of those things, right? Mathematics, I'm terrible at mathematics. I wish they had taught me a little bit more. Right? So those are the kinds of things that liberal arts gives you, uh, 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 a view, an expansive view of what, what education is, I think. Yeah. Okay. Ram, I wanted to ask you about this um, ambitious series that you are uh, curating and editing of um, biographies, historical biographies. Now, I also know that the publishing industry is hugely interested and excited about this, this field. They, they say, in fact, many have told me that historical biographies is really seeing a surge in India right now. Interest is seeing a surge in India. Why do you think that is? And tell me a little bit about the series. Who are the others who will follow Patrick? So, Rama, you know, I think uh, that there is a surge now of interest in historical biographies is wholly welcome and much overdue. You know, um, uh, there's a very sophisticated tradition, or the, there's a very sophisticated historiographical uh, kind of uh, tradition in India. You know, there have been historians of written social histories, economic histories, cultural histories, art histories, and contrary to popular perception, not a uh, perception. Not all have been leftist, let alone Marxist. And they've come from a different uh, kinds of perspectives. I mean, if you look at the great historians of the past or even of the present, you know, if I was to name 50 top class historians from India, I would find it very easy. Or which would include, of course, Western and Japanese scholars writing on India. But these outstanding historians of India, medieval, modern, ancient, cultural, social, political, economic, whatever their specialization, have shied away from biography. I mean, the only professional historian, uh, uh, you know, in the generation before mine, who wrote biographies was Sarvapali Gopal. You know, that's it. You know, and just one. So I was, you know, I, my first biography was published almost 25 years ago of the anthropologist Very Elvin. And I faced, as I said in my talk at the ICR, a lot of hurdles in, uh, from my, my professional peers in uh, embarking on it. Now, fortunately, that has changed. Now, uh, Firstly, there's a great interest, as you say. You know, it's a popular market for nonfiction, for history. And the general reader finds it um, uh, easier, more intimate uh, to approach the past through the figure of a single individual. You know, uh, so not the Indian revolutionary tradition, but Bhagat Singh. Not uh, Hindu social reform, but Ram Mohan Roy or Vivekananda. Not Indian feminism but Kamala Devi Chattopadhyaya, right. So that's, it, it's, it's about that resonates with readers, you're writing about lives, exploring wider historical processes through, uh, you know, the an individual life with all its torment and its achievements and its failures and so on. So I was keen on bridging this gap, particularly because biographies were being written. Often they were by enterprising amateurs who are at these works who are usually either poorly researched or badly written, and sometimes both. And by now I do enough scholars uh, who I thought I could interest, enough credible professional scholars whom I thought I could interest uh, in writing biographies. Some were already writing biographies. So the second volume in the series, which is Chitareka Jutsi's Shekhar Dullah, 10 years ago, she contacted me because I'd written several biographies in the past myself, and I'm a historian of the 20th century like she is. And we had a couple of chats on the phone about how she should approach Sheikh Abdullah. So when the series was conceived, I wrote to Chitareka, I said, do you have a publisher? She said, no. I said, please give your book to my series. On the other hand, there was someone like Patrick, whose work I admired for many years, uh, who had not written a biography. And I suggested to him, given his enormous scholarship on that period and uh, everything around Ashoka, why not he kind of zoom in, as it were, on, on this remarkable figure, uh, you know, uh, himself. So that was the idea. Now, uh, so they are about, I mean, if I look at, if I could just read out some of the forthcoming volumes so that your viewers get a sense of who all will follow Patrick's magnificent book on Ashoka. Later this year, in December or possibly in January, we will have Chitra Rekha Shuchi on Sheikh Abdullah. In the middle of next year, Nico Slate, who's a very fine young American historian, 
has written a fabulous book on Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay. You know, Rama, Kamala Devi is easily the most remarkable Indian woman of the modern period. Much more remarkable than Indira Gandhi, according to me. I mean, she's touched so many lives. She made so many pioneering contributions in nationalism, in social reform, in the women's movement, in the revival of handicrafts, in theater, in literature, in institution building, in taking Gandhi's ideas to the American South uh, in the 1930s, which is one aspect of her work in traveling through China, Japan. So this is a wonderful book that does true justice based to her, you know, many splendid and multifaceted career. Then uh, later on, you know, it, the other books may take, the idea is to have one or two books every year over the next 15 or 20 years. And a work of this kind, a really good biography takes time uh, to mature, to germinate, and to find fulfillment and completion. I mean, in effect, Patrick's book on Ashoka, uh, you could say, has been 50 years in the making. Would that be right, Patrick? Or 40 years in the making? <laughs> right. So, uh, so oh, around that know, time, uh, yes, maybe a little less. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I don't, I, I mean, although obviously he, the writing was very quick because once he decided to write it, he had all the ideas and the arguments and the knowledge and the sources at his fingertips. But I don't want to push people towards deadlines. You know, I think that would be unfair in books of this kind, but still, in no particular order, uh, there will be Richard Davis, who's a great historian of South India on Raja Raja Chola, Prashant Kidambi, who's a very fine historian of modern Maharashtra on Bal Ganga the Tilak, who is really in some ways the first major Hindu nationalist, more interesting than, in my view, and more influential and interesting and more courageous, perhaps, than someone like Savarkar, but who hasn't been written about, and more and as controversial. Harish Damodaran uh, uh, of the Indian Express, a journalist who writes history on Ramakrishna Dalbya, you know, a buccaneering in, uh, industrialist, sort of in the Dhirubhai Ambani mode, but except that he was, was there 60 years before him. Uh, then Akshay Mukul, uh, who last year published a very good biography of the uh, Hindi yeah. poet and writer Agir. Uh, I knew that Akshay was working on Jayaprakash Narayan. I also knew that he was extremely well qualified to do justice to Jayaprakash. I mean, there have been quite a few books on Jayaprakash, just as there have been many books on Ashoka, but none have done him proper justice. And Akshay has a formidable command of Hindi and English. He is an indefatigable archival researcher. He comes from Bihar. He understands the nuances of Bihari and Indian politics. So he will be writing on Jayaprakash Narayan. His research is well advanced. Uh, then I have Aparna Kapadia on Kasturba Gandhi. Now again, you know, how, how this arose. Aparna Kapadia is a historian of uh, Gujarat and also uh, writes occasionally for scroll. So she's a historian who, unlike some of her peers, wants to address a wider audience. So I've been following her writings. So I contacted her. We had a Zoom conversation. I said, would you like to contribute on to the series? She said, I'll consider it. So I said, why don't you write on Mahadev Desai, who was Gandhi's close associate and secretary and a quite remarkable figure. And she came back after a few days. She said, no, I'd rather write on Kasturba Gandhi. So I said, of course, you know, she knows Gujarati, she knows the sources. You know, she studied actually at Gujarati medium school, which is very rare for, you know, uh, Indian history, professional historians who generally like me went to an English language school. So there's Aparna Kapadia on Kasturba. Then one last name and then I'll stop. There's a brilliant young historian of late Mughal India called Abhishek Kekar, who teaches at the University of California in Berkeley. And he wrote a fabulous book on 18th century Delhi called The King and the People, uh, which is a social history of Delhi at a time of the empire's decline. And it's a wonderfully rich and beautifully written book. So I wanted him for my series. Uh, he said he was one of the most promising young historians of India. So I asked him and he said he'd, he'd like to write on a kind of interesting, relatively minor figure called Anand Ram Mukhlis, who was a Hindu scribe and writer and poet and diarist in the Mughal court, who interacted with kings and nobles, but also followed street life and fairs and festivals and conflicts and shoemakers, you know, artisanal uh, you know, uh, uh, troubles and so on and maintained a diary, which is very, very rare in those days, you know. So here was a man who bridged Hindi and Persian, Hindu and Muslim, 
the life of the street and the life of the court in 18th century Delhi. You know, so uh, here was so it's it's, it's kind of very interesting way of capturing a slice of history. You know, because obviously Ashoka is an emperor. Ashoka is an emperor. You know, Kamala Devi is a rebel. This is kind of a writer in between, observing minutely, sideways, on the top, behind. And I'm very looking forward to his book too. So these are some of the works. Uh, I hope I've I've contacted about two dozen writers uh, who have agreed, and slowly they'll come. And you know, we'll see. It. I may contact a few writers. At the moment, I don't want to commission any more works till these come. Right. But this is fascinating, especially the last one, which really talks about. A, a, a moment in history where and and a person who's like an eyewitness to that you know change that moment of change transformation so almost like at the cusp of uh, history you know so it, it, i'm i'm looking forward to that capturing the change kind of book i love those kinds of quantum leap moments in history um uh, patrick i wanted to ask you um we we have the buddhist retellings of ashoka uh, which you say are hagiographic. Uh, we have the inscriptional Ashoka, which is his own words, his own monkey bath on all the rock edicts and uh, across India. Um, we have Nehru's own interpretation. Then we have Romila Thapar's Ashoka. But tell me a little bit about how the Hindus saw Ashoka at that time in, in the centuries, in the immediate centuries that followed. In your book, you talk about um the almost like the there were these um there were these interpretations of the ideal king that were created in hindu scriptures whether that's ram or yudhishthira and these were written and imagined with ashoka in mind so tell me a, l a little bit about this this um tension there yeah. if we may call it that so so yes this uh, the last 20 years or so of epic scholarship, scholarship on the Sanskrit epics, have taken a turn towards looking at Ashoka, who is the unnamed, unspoken presence in the in the epics, uh, and uh, and this comes with the understanding that Ashoka created a kind of reform, uh, both social and especially religious that to some degree marginalized the central position Brahmins had imagined themselves to be within an ideal kingdom. Uh, Ashoka looks at Brahmins as one among many what he calls Pashandas, which are various religious philosophical groups. He did not give, give any precedent to any one of them. Uh, so in a sense, what is being viewed is the Brahmins have been decentralized. They are no longer the center. They don't occupy the foreground. And uh, both the images of Yudhishthira and Rama, especially Yudhishthira, seem to indicate that the Brahmins, through their literary prowess, are bringing back the old ideal uh, in the form of an epic hero. And that has been there for quite some time now. And um, whether you buy into all the nuances of that historical event, uh, it is clear that uh, Professor Johannes Bronkhorst has written a trilogy about this whole phenomenon. And the second of those is Brahmanism in the shadow of Buddhism, and the third, and tellingly, how the Brahmins won. So in a sense, you find the, the resurgence of Brahmanism. Uh, so that is, I think, basically what you have in the, in the centuries uh, following Ashoka. But Ashoka himself is completely forgotten. We have nothing about Ashoka explicitly except in the Buddhist narrative and very, very marginal comments in the Puranic chronology of kingship, kings, just the names, that's all. Uh, so there is no real uh, reckoning with Ashoka and what he did within the historiographic tradition of India. So there's been a long silence 
within yes, India. A two thousand year silence. Two thousand years. Very long, yes. <laughs> Which was broken by whom? Finally, it, it was broken by a man named Princeps, who was a colonial officer who managed to decipher the old Brahmi script, right? So that we could finally read the Ashokan inscriptions. So we all all ended it to him. A lot more work has been done on the script. Uh, the, these <clears throat> people don't realize that these inscriptions are written uh, letter by letter. So there are no what we call today in print white spaces between words. Um, let so, me ask you about yeah. the other silence in the book, uh, in his inscriptions, the silence on um, the caste system, Varna order. Um, yeah. There's the Brahmins are mentioned, but around Ashoka's time, are we to conclude that there was no caste system? Are we to conclude that he did not make any mention of classes, a caste system because he did not write about society? What are we to make of this silence, complete absence silence on Varna order in his inscriptions? What does that go to our understanding of caste system and historiography and provenance of caste system? Right. So uh, let's make a clear distinction today between what we call Varna, there are four of them, and the modern phenomenon of caste. The term caste has taken a life of its own in the colonial and post-colonial period, which is which does not speak to what happened 2,000 years ago. With regard to Varna, let's you know, keep it at that level rather than bring in the word loaded word caste. Uh, with regard to Varna, all the information we have with regard to the Varna system, or I should say most of the evidence we have, come from only single source. That is the writings, especially the scriptural writings that originated from Brahmins. If you think of the Brahmin group of Brahmins, at any time in Indian history, they were first elite and second male and thirdly very small minority. So it is through the lens and the eyes provided by that group that we are looking at India's past. And that itself creates distortions. Uh, I like to tell my students that the, all the texts we have uh, provide a small window, actually a pinprick, through which we are gazing at this large horizon of what is India in the Indian. And we think what is provided by that small number is the reality behind. Ashoka is one of the refreshingly new and different voices we have. What to make of Ashoka's silence with regard to Varna? The very word does not occur. Neither do the three other Varnas, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra. My own view is that he either did not know this, this whole elaborate Brahmanical system, or if he knew, he did not consider it important enough to comment on. Either case, I think uh, Varna at this particular juncture of Ashoka was probably not a strong marker of self-identity. In other words, people didn't go around telling, I am a X, right? Uh, when Ashoka talks about relationships, he talks about various kinds of relationships, uh, meaning relationship to religious groups, Brahmins and Shramanas, relationships to people below you, servants and slaves, relationship to animals, relationship to parents and elders, relationship to your friends and relatives. But caste identity, Varna identity does not figure in those kinds of relationships. So that I think is something that we need to consider when we are dealing with ancient Indian demography or, or sociology. Uh, and I think, I, I personally think, that uh, that uh, that Varna is much more of a ideological statement than a descriptive statement. So it's a prescriptive rather than a descriptive. It does carry historical weight, and of course there were Varnas, especially at a later time, 
Uh, we have inscriptions dealing with that. Um, but but Ashoka tells, allows us or, and forces us uh, to deal with it with greater nuance, I think. Very interesting. Um, you also mentioned that Ashoka was penitent, but not a pacifist. Can you tell the readers what you mean by that? Yes. So he was remorseful. He says he regrets what happened. Uh, almost as if what happened <laughs> maybe didn't have anything to do with him. Of course it did, right? But he doesn't say, I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry that it happened. He does not say, I should not have attacked Kalinga. He never says that. But he's very sorry that 150,000 people were killed. Another 150,000 were deported. Another 100, 150,000 died of causes relating to the war. We are not told what happened to all the people who were taken, deported away. For the most part, in Indian theory, uh, people were taken like that were slaves enslaved. He never says that he released them. He never tells that they send them back to their families in Kalinga. So Asuka is a complicated figure, like most historical figures of that importance, right? So in that sense, he does not, he, to say that he was a pacifist is really, uh, really inaccurate, I think. Uh, what, and in one place, he, he, he hints when he talks about the forest people, the Atavikas, uh, he says, he tells them to behave themselves. He tells them not to offend, to abide by the principle of Ahimsa. But he says, if not, remember that I still have enough force. So he, he just, he just, he doesn't say, I will come and kill you. Sometimes the, the translations give that impression. Uh, the original practice does not say that. But he does hint at it that that this force is available. So, um, how do we? So, do we just drop the pacifism from him totally, and I think and, so. and look at him as a strategic thinker when it when he looks at war, when he looks at use of force? Yes, I think he was a strategic thinker. I think he thought war was bad. That's for sure, and he tells his children and grandchildren, that they hope that he, they find no country worth conquering. He says that explicitly. Mm -hmm. So basically, he seems to abide by the principle that states, in that sense, kingdoms, should abide within their borders that are established. <clears throat> and this was true also of the Greek kingdoms, four of them to the west of the Maori Empire, where uh, there was relative peace. They were not fighting with each other. They abided by the, by the borders that were set after Alexander died. And, and that probably was a model for the Maori Empire. He talks about the, the border peoples, you know? so people who are living at the border. So he was aware of a border of his kingdom. So I think I think pacifism is wrong, and I think he was against war. He was he was clearly a committed to non-injury and ahimsa, um, but he continued, and I'm convinced of that, with the death penalty within his kingdom. So people are put to death in the name of the state, um, and he dealt with criminal elements, uh, elements that he thought was criminal. <laughs> Maybe forest people didn't think that they were criminal, but uh, with with uh, with with force, yeah. So much like the rest of India, uh, Indian prime ministers who came after him, uh, pursue peace but be ready for war. That's usually how that posture is, right? <laughs> um, yes, I... war, war. If it is imposed on you, right? Yes, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ram, I want to ask you one last question. History has truly become pop today. Does that excite you or alarm you? Don't tell me a bit of both. It, it is a bit of both. I'm glad the more people are reading works of history. Uh, I, uh, one of the uh, aims of this series uh, is to encourage 
nudge, cajole, encourage, persuade my fellow historians to write not just for their academic peers, but for a wider audience. Because history is a branch of social science and of literature. Really good historians have the kind of, kind of analytical sharpness that Patrick does. And they also have the literary fluency of just a good nonfiction writer. I mean, you have a certain kind of popular historian who writes beautifully, but you'll get, for example, the answer that Patrick gave you on the absence or presence of Varna in ancient India. You will not get from a popular historian in ancient India today, you know, writing. Right. Now, so at the same time, you have academic historians who write a kind of stuffy, boring, mechanical, jargonized prose, you know, uh, uh, which inhibits their work from being appreciated outside the academy. Sometimes they write that kind of prose because that is what they think impresses their peers, you know, uh, just arbitrarily dropping the name of a French philosopher in a work of, or, you know, or, or cultural history. So I think that that gap is very important to bridge. So I'm happy that there's a market for historical writing. I, I do not uh, grudge, uh, you know, certainly will not say you must have a PhD in history or be a professor to write history. Anyone can write history. Unlike physics, you can learn it on your own without formal training, unlike physics or mathematics. But you have to pay your dues in the archives. You have to uh, do the hard grind. You have to find primary sources. You have to learn the languages if necessary. And above all, you must keep, keep yourself scrupulously away from po politicians and political ideologies today. You know, too many so-called popular historians today want to be photographed with, with their book and the prime minister or the home minister next to me, next to them, which Patrick would never dream of doing, even if the prime minister called him, you know. So, so I think that is something. So I'm happy, but I'm also happy. But above all, my if I have a, a complaint, it is not to the popular historians because they've uh, they've sensed a gap in the market, which they're in an entrepreneurial sense trying to fill. My grudge is my, with my professional historians. I mean, I wish more historians of ancient India, and there's some really fine ones, would you know, uh, learn from Patrick how to take their scholarship and their knowledge to a wider audience. And I think younger people, uh, younger historians are there. I mean, I think one of the things about my series is that though it is, uh, you know, I'm inaugurated in the best possible way by a truly great historian of ancient India writing this truly fabulous book. Some of the later writers are younger, more energetic, uh, uh, in that they still have, are seeking, they're still, you know, it's not a lifetime of scholarship, but they're still searching, still learning, still finding things. And they know, unlike people of my generation, who mocked writing for a common or for a general audience. Can I tell you just one anecdote, if I if I may? Yes, which I don't think Patrick has heard also, uh, a personal anecdote, but which will amuse Patrick. Many years ago, in uh, 1996, I wrote an essay in EPW, the Economic and Political Weekly, which is a critique of subaltern studies turn from doing empirical research to doing textual analysis. So I called it subaltern to Bhadralok studies. That was the name of my essay. It was a critique. It was a critique of how... Okay. Now, after it was published at the Nehru Memorial uh, Library, I ran into a professor from JNU. And who was, uh, who uh, came, I was that, you know, then I was just in my mid thirties. This gentleman was very venerable professor in his early sixties. He said, Ram, I read your article and I liked it very much, uh, your critique. And I, and I made photocopies for my students in JNU to read. And when I gave them the photocopies, I told them, don't be confused by how well it's written. It is still saying important things. Now, <laughs> that's the most curious, delightful, bizarre compliment I have ever received. <laughs> no, don't be confused by how beautifully Patrick's book is written. It is still saying important things. Absolutely, hundred so, percent. So, so in that sense, my main grouse is not against enterprising amateurs, Rama. It is against hidebound academics who refuse to engage with the wider world. Right. So in that sense, yes, absolutely. This book is very relatable. He's, you've made him accessible, relatable. And as what I call, it's Indian history's MAGA moment, our own MAGA moment, make Ashoka great again moment. <laughs> thank you so <laughs> much, uh, Ram. And thank you, Patrick, uh, for joining you, us Ram. on the Prince Soft Cover. It's a delight. Thank you. Thank you.